The dense mist of the mountain pass clung to Caleb's skin like a damp shroud as he pedaled his way up the serpentine trail. He was alone, or so he thought. His bike light cut through the fog in trembling beams, illuminating nothing but the narrow path ahead and the skeletal outlines of towering pine trees. This wasn't his first night ride, but something about this particular route felt wrong. The locals called it the Widow's Trail, and Caleb had dismissed their warnings as superstitious nonsense. Tales of cyclists disappearing, ghostly figures seen flitting between the trees, and a relentless whispering that would accompany riders for miles were just folklore, he reasoned. Caleb thrived on adrenaline, and the idea of conquering a supposedly cursed trail was irresistible. The climb was punishing, his legs burned, and the air grew thinner with every turn. The only sounds were the rhythmic hum of his tires against the dirt and the faint creak of his chain. But then, something else broke the silence. A soft crunch of leaves, not his own. He stopped pedaling and listened. Silence. The forest was unnervingly still. Not even the chirp of a cricket or the hoot of an owl pierced the night. He shook his head, chalking it up to paranoia, and pushed forward. But the feeling persisted, like unseen eyes boring into his back. Caleb glanced over his shoulder, half expecting to see someone or something lurking behind him. There was nothing there, just the mist swallowing the trail. A sudden, low whisper drifted through the trees, so faint he wasn't sure he'd heard it at all. It wasn't the wind. It had a distinct cadence, almost like a voice. Caleb's breath hitched, but he forced himself to laugh. You're just spooking yourself, he muttered, his voice sounding oddly small in the vast emptiness. As he rounded a bend, his bike light caught something unusual, a figure standing in the middle of the trail. He slammed on the brakes, his tires skidding against the dirt. The figure didn't move. It was a woman, draped in tattered white fabric that fluttered slightly despite the still air. Her head was bowed, her long, matted hair obscuring her face. Hey, are you okay? Caleb called out, his voice trembling despite his effort to sound calm. The woman didn't respond. She didn't even flinch. Caleb dismounted, keeping a cautious distance. Ma'am, do you need help? It's dangerous out here. As he took a step closer, she raised her head abruptly, and Caleb's stomach turned to ice. Her face was pale, almost translucent, and her eyes were black pits that seemed to absorb the light from his bike. Her mouth twisted into a grotesque grin, revealing teeth far too sharp and numerous to be human. Caleb stumbled backward, his heart hammering in his chest. The woman let out a low, guttural laugh that seemed to vibrate through the trees. Then in an instant, she vanished, gone as if she'd never been there. He scrambled back onto his bike and pedaled with all his might, his legs screaming in protest. The trail seemed to stretch endlessly, the trees closing in like jagged claws. He could hear the whispers again, louder this time, and they weren't coming from a single direction. They surrounded him, overlapping, incoherent, yet unmistakably mocking. The air grew colder and Caleb's breath came out in panicked clouds. His light began to flicker, the beam dimming and sputtering. No, 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 he muttered, slapping the light in desperation. It died completely, plunging him into darkness. Without warning, the ground beneath him seemed to shift, and his bike wobbled uncontrollably. He hit a root or a rock, he couldn't tell, and was thrown from his bike, landing hard on the forest floor. Pain shot through his arm, but he didn't have time to assess the damage. He could feel them now, figures moving just beyond the edge of his vision, their presence as tangible as the dirt beneath him. A cold hand brushed his ankle, and Caleb screamed, kicking wildly. He scrambled to his feet and bolted down the trail, abandoning his bike. The whispers grew louder, more urgent, like a chorus of deranged voices chasing him through the dark. He didn't dare look back. Finally, the trees thinned and he burst out onto a gravel road, his lungs burning. He collapsed to his knees, gasping for air, the whispers fading as quickly as they'd come. He was safe, or so he thought. A pair of headlights appeared in the distance and a truck pulled up beside him. The driver, an older man with a weathered face, rolled down his window. You all right, son? What the hell are you doing out here? Caleb could barely speak. There was someone on the trail. The man's expression darkened. You were on the widow's trail? Damn fool. You're lucky to be alive. Caleb didn't argue. He climbed into the truck, his body trembling uncontrollably. As they drove away, he glanced out the window and froze. Standing at the edge of the woods was the woman in white, her black eyes gleaming like twin voids. She raised a skeletal hand and waved. 
Caleb never touched a bike again. The sun dipped below the horizon as Lisa and her three friends unloaded their bikes from the truck. The air was crisp, the kind of chill that settles deep in your bones as night falls. They were at the edge of Blackwater Ridge, a trail known among thrill-seekers as the most treacherous and mysterious biking path in the region. Rumors of unexplained disappearances and shadowy figures stalking riders only made it more enticing for their little group of adrenaline junkies. Think we'll meet the Shadow Rider tonight? Jake teased as he adjusted his helmet. The Shadow Rider was the ghostly figure said to haunt the ridge, an apparition that only appeared to those who dared venture the trail after dark. Maybe he'll give us a few tips, Lisa shot back, her voice more confident than she felt. The truth was, she wasn't sure why she'd agreed to this. There was a heaviness in the air that even the others seemed to notice, though no one voiced it. They mounted their bikes and started down the trail. The path was rough, littered with roots and jagged rocks, winding through dense forest. The only light came from their bike lamps, casting eerie shadows that danced with the movement of the trees. The group rode in silence at first, the only sounds the crunch of gravel and the occasional screech of a bird. Then, about a mile in, Lisa noticed something odd. The forest around them seemed wrong. The trees were twisted in unnatural shapes, their branches reaching out like skeletal arms. The air smelled of damp earth and something metallic, like blood. Do you hear that? Sarah, riding just ahead of Lisa, called out. Hear what? Jake asked, though his voice betrayed a hint of unease. Listen. They all stopped, the sudden silence pressing in on them. At first there was nothing. Then it came, a faint, rhythmic sound, like breathing. It was deep and guttural, almost animalistic, but it seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. It's just the wind, Eric said, his voice cracking slightly. Wind doesn't breathe, Sarah whispered. Lisa's skin prickled. Let's keep moving. As they started again, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. Lisa glanced over her shoulder repeatedly, convinced she'd see something lurking just beyond the reach of their lights. But the trail behind them was empty. Then the first scream tore through the night. It was Eric, who'd been riding at the back. They all skidded to a halt, their lamps sweeping the darkness. Eric was gone. His bike lay twisted on the trail, its frame bent as though something massive had crushed it. Eric? Jake shouted, his voice echoing through the forest. There was no answer, only the oppressive quiet and that faint, unearthly breathing. Let's go back, Lisa said, panic rising in her chest. Jake shook his head. We need to find him. Are you insane? Sarah hissed. He's gone. We need to get out of here. Before they could decide, a shadow passed through their beams of light, moving impossibly fast. Lisa's heart slammed in her chest. Whatever it was, it was big. Bigger than any animal she could think of. And it wasn't alone. The breathing grew louder, closer, accompanied now by a low growl that vibrated in their chests. Shadows flickered all around them, darting between the trees, too fast to track. Then, one by one, their bike lights began to fail, flickering and dimming until they were plunged into near-total darkness. Stick together, Jake yelled, but his voice was barely audible over the growls. Something slammed into Sarah, knocking her off her bike and into the trees. She screamed, but it was cut short replaced by a wet, crunching sound that made Lisa's stomach churn. Run! Jake shouted. Lisa didn't need to be told twice. She abandoned her bike and took off down the trail, her lungs burning as terror propelled her forward. Jake was right behind her, but the growling and heavy footfalls were gaining on them. Then she saw it. Just ahead, standing in the middle of the trail, was the Shadow Rider. At first, she thought it was another biker, until she noticed the glowing red eyes and the way its form seemed to flicker and distort as if it were caught between two worlds. Jake skidded to a halt beside her, his face pale. What the hell is that? The shadow rider raised an arm, pointing directly at them. The growling stopped, replaced by an unnatural silence. Then, with a deafening roar, the shadows around them converged. Lisa screamed as something cold and solid slammed into her, dragging her into the darkness. She fought, kicking and clawing, but it was like trying to fight smoke. She felt herself being pulled deeper, the cold seeping into her very soul. When she woke, it was daylight. She was lying on the side of the trail, her clothes torn and her body covered in scratches. Jake, Sarah, and Eric were gone, and so were their bikes. The forest was eerily quiet, the trail pristine as if nothing had happened. She stumbled back to the trailhead where her truck sat untouched. 
When the police arrived, they found no trace of her friends or the Shadow Rider. But the officer who interviewed her seemed uneasy, his eyes darting to the woods as she recounted her story. You're not the first, he said finally, and you won't be the last. Lisa left Blackwater Ridge that day and never returned, but sometimes late at night she swears she can still hear that breathing, deep, guttural, and far too close. The moon was a pale crescent in the sky, offering little light as Kevin rode his bike down Old Ridgeway Trail. It wasn't just a shortcut home, it was a rite of passage for the daring. Every local knew the stories. The ghost cyclist, a phantom figure said to haunt the trail, chasing down riders who dared to tread its path after midnight. Kevin didn't believe in ghost stories, at least not until that night. The trail was quiet except for the crunch of gravel under his tires and the occasional rustle of leaves in the trees. The air was heavy, the kind of stillness that seemed to hold its breath. Kevin adjusted his headlamp, its narrow beam cutting through the darkness ahead, though it didn't seem to reach far enough. A low, chilling breeze brushed against him, carrying with it the faintest sound, wheels spinning on gravel. Kevin slowed down, glancing behind him. Nothing. Just the empty trail and the shadows of the woods. He chuckled nervously. Come on, man, get a grip, he muttered, pedaling faster. But the sound came again louder this time. It wasn't an echo of his own bike. It was something else, something deliberate. The unmistakable whir of another bike approaching from behind. Kevin's heart thumped as he looked over his shoulder. His headlamp's faint spill of light revealed nothing. The trail behind him was as empty as before, yet the sound persisted, growing closer, more insistent. The cadence of the pedals was unnaturally steady, almost mechanical. Hey, Kevin called out, his voice shaky. Who's there? The only reply was the steady rhythm of the phantom wheels. Panic set in. He leaned into his handlebars and pedaled as hard as he could, his legs burning with exertion. The trail twisted and turned, and the trees seemed to close in tighter, their gnarled branches reaching like skeletal fingers. But no matter how fast he went, the sound followed, always just out of sight. Then, the cold hit him. It wasn't the normal chill of the night air. It was something bone deep, like the air itself had turned to ice. His breath came out in visible puffs, and frost began to form on his handlebars. The bike creaked, the metal groaning under the sudden drop in temperature. Kevin glanced back again, and this time he saw it. A figure loomed in the distance, like just barely illuminated by the faint glow of his lamp. It was a cyclist, but something was wrong. The figure was unnaturally tall, its head bent at an impossible angle as if its neck had been broken. Its bike didn't seem to touch the ground. It hovered just above it, the wheels spinning silently. The rider's face was obscured, but Kevin could feel its gaze, cold and unyielding, boring into him. No, 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 Kevin whispered, tears stinging his eyes. He pushed himself harder, the muscles in his legs screaming as he tried to outrun the impossible. The figure gained on him effortlessly, gliding over the trail with an eerie grace. Kevin's bike light began to flicker, the beam sputtering as the cold grew more intense. The shadows around him seemed to deepen, swallowing the trail ahead. Then the voice came, a guttural, rasping whisper that seemed to come from every direction at once. Why do you ride my trail? Kevin didn't answer. He couldn't. His throat was dry, his chest tight with terror. He focused on the path ahead, willing himself not to look back. The voice grew louder, more insistent. You cannot escape. The ground beneath him shifted, and suddenly, the trail wasn't the familiar dirt path anymore. It was black, slick, and endless, stretching into a void that seemed to have no end. The trees were gone, replaced by swirling shadows that reached out toward him, clawing at his tires. Kevin's bike jolted violently, and he was thrown to the ground. Pain shot through his shoulder as he landed hard, his helmet skidding across the trail. The sound of spinning wheels stopped abruptly, replaced by a deafening silence. He scrambled to his feet, his hands trembling as he, as he reached for his bike. But when he looked up, the ghost cyclist was there, mere feet away. Its face was pale and gaunt, its hollow eyes filled with an unnatural light. The bike it rode seemed to shimmer, its frame twisted and broken in ways that defied logic. You ride where you don't belong, it hissed. Kevin stumbled back, his breath coming in ragged gasps. I'm sorry, he choked out. I didn't mean to. The cyclist raised a skeletal hand, pointing directly at him. 
The ground beneath Kevin cracked open, revealing an abyss that pulsed with a sickly red glow. Shadows rose from the pit, wrapping around his legs and pulling him down. He screamed, clawing at the trail, but the shadows were too strong. The last thing Kevin saw before he was dragged into the darkness was the ghost cyclist, its broken smile etched into his mind forever. When hikers found his bike the next morning, it was frost-covered, lying on a perfectly intact trail. Kevin was never seen again. But some nights, if you stand at the edge of Old Ridgeway Trail, you might hear it. The faint whir of wheels and a whisper in the wind. Ride with me. It was supposed to be a quick evening ride through Raven's Hollow, a remote trail that wound through an ancient forest. Ellie had heard stories about the place, of course. Everyone in town had. Tales of ghostly apparitions, eerie cries in the night, and bikers who entered the trail only to vanish without a trace. But Ellie wasn't the superstitious type. To her, it was just another challenge, another trail to conquer. The sun was setting as she set off, the horizon streaked with deep oranges and purples. The towering trees cast long shadows that danced across the dirt path. It was beautiful in a haunting sort of way. The first few miles were uneventful. The trail was quiet, the only sounds the steady rhythm of her tires and the occasional rustle of leaves. But as the sun sank lower and the forest darkened, the atmosphere changed. The air grew heavier, the kind of oppressive stillness that made her ears strain for any sound. Then it came, a soft, distant cry. Ellie slowed, her heart skipping a beat. It sounded human, but distorted, like a voice stretched thin and warped by the wind. She paused, glancing around, but the forest was silent once more. Shaking her head, she laughed nervously. Just an owl, she muttered, though her voice lacked conviction. She pedaled on, a little faster this time. The cry came again, louder now, and unmistakably close. It was a wail, high-pitched and mournful, sending chills racing down her spine. She stopped completely, her hands gripping the handlebars tightly. Hello? She called out, her voice trembling. There was no response, only the sound of the trees swaying in a breeze she couldn't feel. She decided to keep moving, convinced that stopping would only feed her growing fear. But the farther she rode, the stranger things became. The trail seemed to change beneath her wheels, the dirt growing darker, almost black, and the air colder with each passing minute. The trees, once tall and majestic, now appeared twisted and grotesque, their branches reaching out like skeletal hands. Then her bike light flickered. Ellie's breath caught in her throat as the beam dimmed and sputtered. She smacked the light, but it continued to fail, casting uneven, jerking shadows along the path. In those brief moments of light, she thought she saw something, a figure standing just beyond the trees, watching her. Who's there? She shouted, her voice cracking. The figure didn't move. It was tall, unnaturally so, and its face was obscured by darkness. It was dressed in what looked like tattered clothing, and its posture was all wrong, bent and twisted like it had been broken in multiple places. Ellie's survival instincts kicked in. She pedaled as hard as she could, her legs burning as the trail blurred beneath her. But the figure didn't stay behind. It followed, not running but gliding, its movements jerky and unnatural. The sound of its pursuit wasn't footsteps. It was a scraping noise, like claws dragging across the ground. Her bike light failed completely, plunging her into darkness. Panic took over, and she rode blindly, relying on memory and sheer adrenaline. The scraping sound grew louder, closer, accompanied by a low, guttural growl that seemed to echo in her skull. She risked a glance over her shoulder and screamed. The figure was right behind her, its face now visible. It wasn't human. Not anymore. Its skin was gray and stretched taut over its bones, and its eyes were hollow pits that glowed with a sickly yellow light. Its mouth hung open, revealing rows of jagged teeth, and from its throat came that awful wail she'd heard earlier. Ellie's front tire hit a root, and she was thrown from her bike. She landed hard. The wind knocked out of her as pain shot through her arm. Gasping, she scrambled to her feet, but her bike was a mangled mess, its front wheel bent beyond repair. The figure loomed over her now, its hollow eyes locked onto hers. It raised a clawed hand, pointing at her as its mouth twisted into an unnatural smile. The wail returned, louder than ever, filling her ears until she thought her head would explode. No, she screamed, stumbling backward. She turned and ran, her body trembling with fear and exhaustion. The trail seemed endless, the darkness pressing in on her from all sides. 
The wailing never stopped, growing fainter as if mocking her attempts to escape. Finally, she burst out of the woods and onto the empty road that led back to town. The sound ceased abruptly, and the air was silent once more. She collapsed onto the asphalt, gasping for breath, her body shaking uncontrollably. When she looked back, the trail was gone. Where, where the entrance had been was now an impenetrable wall of trees, as if the forest had swallowed it whole. Ellie made it home that night, but she was never the same. The scratches on her arms and legs healed, but the memories didn't. Sometimes, in the dead of night, she would hear it again. That mournful wail, faint but unmistakable, calling her back to Raven's Hollow. The rain had turned the dirt trail into a slick, muddy mess, but Mark didn't care. He was determined to finish his ride before nightfall. The forest surrounding Hollow Creek Trail was dense and suffocating, the trees towering high above and forming a canopy that blocked out the fading light. He adjusted his headlamp as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long, jagged shadows that seemed to move when he wasn't looking. The trail had a reputation. Stories of bikers hearing footsteps in the woods, of sudden cold spots, and of ghostly figures appearing in the periphery of vision were common among locals. Mark, however, wasn't a believer. To him, the trail was just another challenge, a test of endurance and skill. As he pedaled deeper into the woods, the sounds of the outside world faded, replaced by the steady rhythm of his bike and the occasional crackle of branches under his tires. The rain had slowed to a drizzle, but the mist rising from the wet ground seemed to thicken, swallowing the light from his headlamp. That's when he noticed the silence. The usual forest sounds, the chirp of crickets, the rustle of leaves, the distant hoot of an owl, had vanished. The only sound was his own breathing and the faint squeak of his chain. He stopped, his bike skidding slightly on the wet trail, and listened. Nothing. Mark shook his head and chuckled nervously. Getting in your own head, buddy, he muttered, pedaling again. But the unease lingered, crawling up his spine like cold fingers. A few minutes later, it started. At first, it was subtle, a soft crunch like someone stepping on leaves. He glanced over his shoulder, but his light revealed nothing but the empty trail behind him. He kept riding, his heart beating a little faster. The crunching grew louder, keeping pace with him. It wasn't his tires. This was different, deliberate. He slowed, straining to listen. The sound stopped. Mark's breath caught. He scanned the woods with his light, but the trees stood still, their twisted branches like frozen hands reaching toward the sky. Swallowing hard, he pushed forward. The trail twisted sharply, and as he rounded the corner, his headlamp illuminated something that made him slam on the brakes. A figure stood in the middle of the trail, about fifty feet ahead. It was cloaked in shadows, tall and unmoving. The light from his lamp barely reached it, but Mark could see enough to know it wasn't normal. Its head tilted unnaturally to one side, and its arms hung limply at its sides. It looked human, but wrong. Hey, Mark called out, his voice shaking. You okay? The figure didn't move. It stood there, silent and still, its face obscured by the shadows. Mark's instincts screamed at him to turn around, but his pride got the better of him. He edged his bike forward cautiously, his eyes never leaving the figure. I'm just passing through, he said, more to reassure himself than anything else. Then it moved. Not like a person. The figure jerked forward in short, unnatural bursts, as if dragged by invisible strings. Mark's blood turned to ice as it advanced, its head twitching violently with each step. He backed up, his tires slipping in the mud, his hands trembling on the handlebars. Without thinking, he turned and pedaled as fast as he could. The figure's movement was no longer jerky. It was fast. Too fast. Mark could hear it now, its steps pounding the ground behind him, accompanied by a low, guttural sound that didn't belong to any animal he knew. The trail seemed to stretch on forever, the trees closing in like prison walls. His headlamp flickered, and in the brief moments of darkness, he could feel it gaining on him. The sound of its pursuit was deafening now, a mix of wet slaps and scraping as though it was dragging something heavy behind it. Mark's bike hit a root, and he was thrown to the ground. Pain exploded in his side as he scrambled to his feet, his bike lying useless on the trail. He turned to face the figure, his breath ragged, his vision blurring. It was closer now, only a few feet away. The light from his headlamp caught its face, or what should have been a face. There were no features, just a smooth, pale surface, stretched tight like a blank canvas. 
From the center of its head came a single black void, swirling and pulsating as if alive. The figure raised a hand, impossibly long fingers extending toward him. Mark stumbled backward, tripping over his bike and landing hard on the muddy trail. The void began to hum, a deep vibration that resonated in his chest and made his ears ring. No, Mark whispered, crawling backward. This isn't real. The hum grew louder and the figure lunged. Mark screamed. When search parties found his bike the next morning, it was tangled in the brush, coated in a thick black sludge that smelled of decay. There was no sign of Mark, but the searchers spoke of an eerie stillness in the woods, a silence that felt heavy and wrong. To this day, Hollow Creek Trail remains avoided after dark. Riders who dare to venture there speak of footsteps that don't belong to them, shadows that move when they shouldn't, uh, and a hum that lingers long after they've left the woods. But no one has seen Mark or the faceless figure since that night. The stretch of highway known as Deadman's Loop was notorious among cyclists and drivers alike. It was a winding, treacherous road that cut through the dense pinewood forest, a shortcut that saved time but was avoided by most after sunset. Stories of phantom riders, ghostly figures on bikes, and strange lights were whispered around campfires, but none of it had ever been proven. David heard the tales but dismissed them as local legends designed to spook newcomers. A seasoned cyclist with a taste for night rides, he decided to take Dead Man's Loop for the first time. It's just a road, he told himself as he set off, the night air crisp and cool against his face. The first few miles were uneventful, the glow of his bike's light illuminating the cracked asphalt ahead. The towering pines on either side formed a shadowy tunnel, their branches arching overhead like skeletal hands. The only sounds were the hum of his tires and the faint rustle of wind through the trees. But then the air changed. It grew colder, unnaturally so, and the wind seemed to stop entirely. The silence became oppressive, the kind that made Dave acutely aware of every breath, every heartbeat. He shook off the unease and kept riding, his pace quickening. That's when he noticed the headlights. They appeared behind him, distant but growing brighter with every passing second. The road was narrow and winding, with barely enough room for a bike and a car to pass side by side. Dave pulled to the edge, expecting the vehicle to overtake him. But it didn't. The headlights stayed behind him, perfectly matched to his speed. No engine noise accompanied them, only the soft crunch of tires on the road. Dave glanced over his shoulder, his heart pounding. The lights were blinding, but he couldn't make out a car, just two glowing orbs hovering in the darkness. Great, he muttered, trying to sound nonchalant. Some jerk playing games. He pedaled faster, hoping to outpace the mysterious vehicle. But no matter how hard he pushed, the lights stayed with him, unwavering and unnervingly steady. Then they started to flicker. It was subtle at first, like a bulb about to burn out. But the flickering grew more erratic, and the lights began to move unnaturally, swaying side to side as if they weren't attached to anything solid. Dave's stomach churned as a low hum filled the air, vibrating through the road and into his bones. He glanced back again and froze. The headlights weren't attached to a car. Instead, they floated midair, casting no shadows, their glow cold and otherworldly. Between them was a figure, barely visible in the dim light. It was hunched over, skeletal, and perched on a bike that seemed to shimmer and distort, its frame impossibly thin and jagged. Uh, the figure's face, or what passed for one, was shrouded in darkness, but Dave could feel its eyes on him, burning with malice. Panic surged through him. He leaned into his handlebars, pedaling with everything he had. The trail blurred beneath him as he sped down the winding road, the ghostly light still chasing him. The hum grew louder, morphing into a guttural roar that seemed to echo from all directions. Suddenly, the road ahead changed. The asphalt cracked and warped, as if the ground itself were rejecting his presence. The towering pines bent inward, their branches clawing at him as he passed. The headlights behind him flickered faster, erratically lighting the unnatural scene. Then came the voice. You shouldn't be here. It wasn't a voice so much as a presence, a force that filled his head with crushing weight. It was cold and emotionless, yet laced with an undeniable anger. Dave's vision blurred, his legs burning as he pushed himself to the limit. The figure was closer now, its skeletal bike gliding over the warped road. It raised a bony hand, pointing at him. Shadows erupted from the ground, twisting and writhing like living things. 
One lashed out, grazing his shoulder, and a searing cold shot through his body. No! Dave screamed, swerving wildly. The shadows closed in, their icy tendrils reaching for him. His front tire struck something, he didn't see what, and he was thrown from his bike, tumbling onto the cracked asphalt. Pain exploded through his body, but he forced himself to look up. The figure loomed over him, its hollow eyes glowing with a sickly green light. Its bike creaked and groaned, the sound of tortured metal as it leaned forward. The skeletal hand reached for him, impossibly long fingers brushing his face. The cold was unbearable, like his soul was being pulled from his body. Desperate, Dave grabbed a rock from the ground and threw it at the figure. It passed through the specter harmlessly, but the act seemed to break its focus. The shadows hesitated, writhing in confusion. Dave scrambled to his feet and ran, his bike forgotten. The road seemed endless, stretching far beyond what he remembered. The headlights and the figure remained behind him, unmoving, but he could feel its gaze boring into his back. The hum faded, replaced by an unnatural silence. Finally, the forest thinned, and he stumbled onto a main road. A passing car slowed, its driver rolling down the window to ask if he was all right. Dave couldn't answer, his breath ragged and his body trembling. He collapsed to his knees, the warmth of the car's headlights a stark contrast to the cold he'd just escaped. When the police arrived, they found no sign of the figure or Dave's bike. The stretch of road he described was intact, with no cracks or shadows. But the driver who found him mentioned a strange glow in the woods, like headlights hovering in midair. Dave never rode Dead Man's Loop again. And though he tried to forget, he couldn't shake the memory of the skeletal figure, or the voice that still whispered in his dreams, You shouldn't be here. The Blood Moon Ride was an annual tradition for cycling enthusiasts in the town of Hollow Peak. Every year, on the night of the Blood Moon, riders gathered to tackle the Devil's Spine, a treacherous trail carved into the side of a jagged mountain. It was said to be haunted, but the thrill of the challenge outweighed any ghost story for most participants. Sarah wasn't a seasoned rider, but her friends had convinced her to join this year. It's all hype, they told her. Just a spooky story to make the ride more exciting. She wasn't so sure, but peer pressure and the promise of bragging rights won her over. The group of 30 riders set off as the blood moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie crimson glow over the landscape. The trail was steep and narrow, snaking along sheer cliffs and through dense patches of forest. Sarah stayed near the middle of the pack, comforted by the presence of her friends. The first mile was uneventful, aside from the occasional nerve-wracking glance at the drop-off to her left. The forest loomed ahead, its trees' trees twisted and bare, their branches clawing at the blood-red sky. As they entered the woods, the temperature plummeted. Sarah shivered, adjusting her jacket. She glanced at her friend Jenna, who was riding beside her. Cold, huh? She said, forcing a smile. Jenna didn't respond. Her face was pale, her eyes fixed ahead. Jenna? Sarah called again. But when Jenna turned to look at her, Sarah's heart stopped. Her face was wrong. Her eyes were black void, skin stretched tight like it didn't quite fit her skull. She smiled, her lips splitting at the corners, revealing teeth that were far too sharp. Sarah screamed and swerved, nearly colliding with another rider. When she looked again, Jenna was gone, replaced by an empty stretch of trail. Are you okay? Another rider called from behind. Sarah nodded shakily, unsure of what she had just seen. She tried to convince herself it was a trick of the light, but the growing dread in her chest told her otherwise. The group pressed on, the trail growing darker and narrower. The crimson moonlight barely penetrated the thick canopy above. The riders' lights flickered, casting jittery shadows that seemed to move on their own. Then came the whispers. They started softly, almost inaudible, like the rustle of leaves in the wind. But as they continued, they grew louder, more insistent. Words began to form, low, guttural voices speaking in a language Sarah didn't recognize. She looked around, but the other riders seemed unaffected, their focus on the trail ahead. Do you hear that? She asked the rider nearest to her, a man named Greg. Hear what? He replied, glancing at her with a puzzled expression. The whispers, she said, her voice trembling. Greg shook his head. You're just spooking yourself. Keep riding. But Sarah couldn't shake the feeling that the whispers weren't in her head. They were all around her, coming from the trees, the ground, and even the air itself. She gripped her handlebars tighter, her breath quickening. 
The group rounded a sharp bend, and the forest opened up to a small clearing. In the center stood an old wooden signpost, its paint faded and illegible. The riders paused to regroup, some sipping water, others adjusting their gear. Sarah felt a sudden pull, an invisible force urging her toward the signpost. She dismounted her bike, her legs moving on their own. Sarah? Greg called after her, but she didn't respond. As she approached the signpost, the whispers grew deafening. She could feel them vibrating in her skull, their words now clear. Turn back. Leave this place. She reached out to touch the sign, and the world around her shifted. The clearing disappeared, replaced by a charred and lifeless wasteland. The trees were blackened stumps, the ground cracked and smoking. The air was thick with the stench of burning flesh. Figures emerged from the shadows, riders or what was left of them. Their bikes were rusted and broken, their bodies twisted and skeletal. Their hollow eyes glowed with an unnatural light as they stared at her. You shouldn't be here, one of them rasped, its voice a grotesque echo. Sarah stumbled back, her heart pounding. She turned to run, but the clearing was gone, the trail replaced by a narrow path that stretched into an endless void. She was alone. Uh, her breath caught as a hand clamped down on her shoulder. She spun around to see Greg, but his face was no longer his. It was decayed, his jaw hanging loosely, his eyes milky and unseeing. Ride, he whispered, his voice guttural and broken. She screamed and pushed past him, jumping on her bike and pedaling blindly into the void. The path twisted and turned, the whispers now, a deafening roar. Shadows clawed at her from the edges, their icy touch sending shocks of pain through her body. Finally, she saw it, a faint light ahead. She pushed herself harder, her legs burning, her lungs screaming for air. The light grew brighter, and with a final burst of energy, she broke through. She collapsed onto the pavement, gasping for breath. She was back at the starting point of the trail, the other riders nowhere in sight. Her bike was coated in ash, her clothes torn and singed. The next morning, search teams scoured the trail for the other riders. None of them were ever found. The Blood Moon ride was never held again, and Sarah left Hollow Peak, never speaking of what she had seen. But sometimes, late at night, she hears the whispers. They call her name, urging her to return to the Devil's Spine to finish the ride she should never have started.